Okay, welcome back after the break. Uh, just before we went for our break, we were looking, uh, we read through chapter four, the last uh, chapter uh, Paul is writing to uh, Timothy, uh, which is second Timothy chapter four. Uh, we're looking at verses one and uh, two where Paul is uh, giving him a charge, a testimony, and he's saying this is very, very important because I'm giving you this charge uh, before God and the Lord uh, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, you know, be preach the word, be uh, uh, willing to preach the word in season and out of season. And he says, even as you preach the word, convince, which means, you know, uh, convict people, uh, of the lies, you know, convict people of the truth, convict people of sin, uh, challenge them to live, uh, to overcome sin, overcome the lies of the enemy, false doctrines, just encourage people's heart, you know, um, also, you know, he says rebuke, uh, even as you preach rebuke, which means, you know, lovingly bring about correction, uh, uh, lovingly bring correction in the lives of people, correct them about the, the false, uh, the lies of the enemy, uh, the the false truth, the false doctrines, you know, correct them about their mannerisms, their way of life, the way they are living and indulging in sin. But even as you do it, you know, do it uh, in a very loving way. And then he says, exhort them, which means, you know, just motivate them, inspire them, encourage them uh, to change, to uh, accommodate the change, uh, uh, to just allow the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives, allow scripture to retransform them, uh, you know, um, and, uh, you know, make them like uh, their, their master and their creator. Just invite them uh, into this whole uh, aspect of living holy lives and, you know, uh, 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 and, and invite them into being Christ-like being holy just as uh, Christ is holy. So even as we preach and teach, you know, Paul has written this to Timothy, uh, you know, even as we preach and teach, we need to do it uh, with, you know, do it in a way that will convince people, uh, will correct them uh, uh, in a loving way, in, 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 in a humble way, and also exhort them, which means just encourage them, motivate them, inspire them, and invite them to accommodate the change, to be transformed into uh, Christ like this. And even as he says this, you know, do all of this with long suffering, which means do it now be patient when you are teaching. He's already spoken about this to Timothy in the same um, letter, Second Timothy in chapter 2, verse 23, uh, where he says, you know, uh, 24, he says, uh, 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 23, he says, uh, avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And in chapter 2, verse 24, he continues to say, the servant of Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach and be patient. You know, so even as uh, uh, Paul is saying, you know, even as you preach and teach, you know, you will be so fed up. You know, I'm just teaching and preaching the truths. These people don't seem to understand, to comprehend. They're running behind these false teachers. They're listening to them. Uh, they're not able to take a stand. They're neither here, neither there. You know, this can demotivate you, get you angry and all of that, but he says, just be patient. But long suffering, preach, uh, convince, rebuke, and um, exhort, because, you know, the fact is people will not get it, got everything at the first time, you know. They've heard it once, you need to keep repeating, you need to keep teaching it in different ways. And he says, you know, patiently present the word of God, uh, giving people the time to embrace the uh, truth. So even as we preach and teach, you know, people will not get everything at the first go. They will not learn, but we need to be patient. We need to continue teaching them, continue presenting the truths in various ways and uh, getting them, giving them the time to embrace the uh, truth. And so he goes on to say, why uh, should we teach patiently? In verses 3 and 4, he says, why should we teach patiently? Because he says in verse 3, that there will be be a time when people will not endure sound uh, doctrine. 
you know, there will be a time when people will not want to hear the truths of God's word. They would not want to hear about sin, salvation, uh, judgment, second coming, uh, you know, all of those things, uh, who Christ is, uh, his nature, his work, the work, person and work of the Holy Spirit. They will just want to hear sermons that are motivational, that will help them make them feel good, make them feel happy. And, uh, you know, talking about prosperity, talking about blessing, not about sin and salvation and all of those things. And when they are so inclined to hear uh, motivational preaching and talk, things that will make them feel good, things that will make them feel happy, you know, they will shy away from uh, the sound teaching of God's word. And, you know, such people will just kind of flock around uh, these preachers and teachers uh, who are teaching all of these uh, feel-good messages, motivational messages. And even as people wander around them and listen to them, you know, they will slowly uh, 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 wander away from the truth in God's word. And once they do that, they will start following, you know, myths and fables and man-made uh, stories. So, you know, um, people will then want to replace the truth of the in the word of God in scripture with man-made fables and man-made uh, stories. So they will just leave the word of God and they will just the truth in God's word and they will embrace fantastic fantasies. Uh, for example, they will reject and have nothing to do uh, with you know what the word of God talks about creation, they will just believe that creation uh, came about by a big bang. Everything just evolved by itself. It just you know it, it, it just the right environment, the right protons, uh, neutrons. You know everything, uh, uh, the RNA, the DNA, just everything just came into perfect alignment, collided with each other, just formed things. So they will just kind of uh, begin to you know. Uh, 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 given to all of these man-made uh, fables, man-made stories, also that, you know, we live in a greater grace period, uh, you know, there is, uh, uh, God will not correct us for our sin, uh, you know, because we're living in this grace period, we can do whatever we want, and His grace is freely available. Uh, so all of these things that, you know, these man-made stories, they will just kind of believe in those things. So it's so important for us to keep teaching and preaching the Word of God, because people are just hearing it, you know, uh, on a Sunday just for a 40 minute, but the rest of the week, they're bombarded with content from the internet, from people, uh, which they're just listening to. And uh, most of them uh, kind of believe those things as truth. And so it's so important for us to keep teaching and preaching uh, the Word of God. So what is the danger here? The danger is that, you know, uh, uh, they'll miss out on uh, all that God seeks to do in their lives uh, 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 or all that God seeks to bring into their lives through his uh, word. We know that God's word is the truth. God works by his word. His word is power. His word is life. Uh, his word, uh, you know, fulfills uh, the purpose for which it goes forth, achieves the reason for which it goes forth. And there are so many things that the word of God uh, can do. Uh, it's only when people continue in the word of God, they will know the truth and the truth will set them free. Uh, from all the lies of the enemy, from all of these man-made stories and the fables, uh, the truth will set them free, like we, as we read in John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. It's only when they hear the word of God and they do the word of God that they have a solid foundation. Uh, they will be like that house that is built on the rock. So, you know, any storms that come their way, whether it's the lies of the enemy, it's this attack, his schemes, uh, it's the uh, uh, false teachings, the cults, they'll be able to weather any storm because they have their solid foundation built on the word of God and the nature of God, uh, as we read in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 and 27. And we know that the word of God sanctifies 
Jesus in his high priestly prayer, John chapter 14, he says, Father, sanctify them, uh, let them know the truth. Uh, the word of God purifies us, First Peter chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. And it also builds us up in the faith. And there are so many things the word of God can also uh, do in our lives. So what we need to do is, you know, um, things that are going around us people are so caught up in in so many things that they read you know you don't be highlighting those things don't highlight the the cults or the wrong teachings the false teachings that are have come up in your city or town or the impacting your churches you just you know speak the truth of god that uh, uh confounds or goes against you know the, the the lies of the enemy or the false teaching you teach them the truth and people will be able to apply the truth what they have learned against the false teachings that they are uh, hearing to. And then he says, you know, uh, Timothy, stay focused in verse 5. says, but you be watchful in all things, endure affliction, do the work of the evangelist, and fulfill your uh, ministry. So he's basically telling Timothy, uh, don't get distracted with things around you. Just be sober, be watchful, and be careful. And he says, you know, endure afflictions. So uh, Paul is telling Timothy, hey, Timothy, just like life has various challenges, uh, uh, various afflictions that life throws at us, the same in the ministry as well. Uh, you know, uh, for some people, uh, they think that ministry is just a beautiful spiritual experience. There will be no challenges. There will be no difficulties. Uh, but, you know, even as we serve God, yes, there are wonderful blessings that we receive, but there are also afflictions, and these afflictions, we need to endure these afflictions, and that is what uh, Paul is telling uh, Timothy. So what do you do uh, in the times of afflictions and difficulties? You know, you need to stay strong. Don't shy away from these challenges and problems. Keep proclaiming uh, the good news of Jesus Christ. Preach and teach it. And, you know, continue running your race with perseverance, with endurance, fixing your eyes on Jesus, you know, and uh, 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 complete what Christ has taken hold of you. Complete the assignment that God has given you and what he has entrusted you with. Okay, so that is what he says in verse 5, he tells Timothy to stay focused. And then he goes on, Paul goes on to talk about his own journey uh, in verses 6 uh, to 8. Can one of you please read verses 6 to 8, please? For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award, me, award to me on the that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Amen. Thank you, Asha. So here, Paul knows that he's going to be, uh, you know, martyred very soon. And he says his life is being offered up for the sake of the gospel. And he says he's being, his life is going to be poured out as a drink uh, offering. Uh, so what does it? What does Paul mean here? He's talking about the Old Testament uh, uh, ritual or the Old Testament sacrifice. You know, uh, the drink drink offering uh, was one thing that was used uh, every morning and for the morning and evening uh, sacrifice. Uh, we read about this in Exodus chapter twenty nine, verse forty and forty one, where you know uh, God tells them you need to take a lamb. Uh, and along with that lamb, one tenth of an ephah of flour mixed with one fourth of a hin of uh, pressed oil and one fourth of a hin of wine as a drink offering. So uh, even uh, as this you know morning and evening sacrifice was made every day in the tabernacle in the temple, you know. Uh, uh, you know, where a lamb was taken, which was sacrificed, and then the meal offering and the drink offering was poured on that sacrifice and everything was burnt up uh, with a fire. So, you know, Paul here basically is not seeing his whole execution as a 
cruel tragedy or as something that's an unfair treatment in the view of uh, the many years that he has uh, you know dedicated in serving the lord and preaching and teaching the word rather he sees his whole life as uh, uh, you know culminating as an offering as a sacrificial uh, life and that's such a beautiful way of just looking at his entire life isn't it you know just looking at his life uh, not as you know a cruel tragedy or something that is an unfair treatment but you know his whole life he's looking at this as culminating as an offering as a sacrificial uh, life so you know just like i said after the sacrificial lamb had been placed on the altar and just before it was lit by fire for the whole uh, uh, offering to be consumed, you know, they, the, the priest would pour on it a quarter of uh, wine, uh, and it was the final sacrifice that was, you know, poured out on the existing sacrifice that was there on the altar. So this is how, you know, Paul is basically looking at his own death, his whole life. Uh, he's, uh, you know, his 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 whole life. He's he's seeing his whole life as a living sacrifice. Uh, that has been presented uh, to God and now he's looking as his death would be a drink offering that would be poured on top of his life being a living uh, sacrifice you know um, so you know uh, just like he says in Romans chapter 12 verse 1 you know, therefore I urge you brethren in the view of the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing and acceptable to God and this is your spiritual uh, act of worship so you know he's saying that my whole life is this lamb that you know the spiritual sacrifice that is being offered on the altar you know the like the morning and the evening sacrifice and then he says my death is like this you know drink offering that is being poured on uh, top of that. So it means that, you know, he's saying it's important to finish uh, well. You need to, it's important to finish your life um, well. Yes, you need to view all of your life as a, as a sacrifice of worship unto God, but it's also important that, you know, uh, you finish your life well, you serve him and do uh, till the very end, you do what God has called and purpose you uh, to do. You don't serve God, you know, uh, in order to get praise or uh, to get, you know, appreciation from others, but you serve Christ as an act of worship. Uh, towards uh, him so even, even if other people you know turn away from you they you know they speak bad about you so Paul is going through all of this you know many people have uh, disowned him because he's in chains he's in prison he writes about it many of them have deserted him left him uh, uh, they don't even they don't even want to say that they have been friends with Paul co-workers with Paul you know but Paul is saying you know uh, don't look at all of those things you know, um, you know, don't look for your reward here in uh, on earth, but you know, offer your body as a living sacrifice. You know, uh, offer your uh, self. You know, your death should be like a drink offering that is poured out uh, because you are offering it uh, to God, and there is a, a reward that will be given to um, you. You know, so even if you're going to be martyred, you know, don't be afraid. Uh, uh, because, you know, that is like an offering, a drink offering that has been poured out on the sacrifice that has already been made to uh, God. So just such a beautiful way in which Paul is looking at his whole life, his ministry, and also his um, uh, death. So, you know, it, it's important that, you know, Paul is saying you finish your life well in the view of, uh, 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 and also view yourself as somebody who is, you know, has no significance or who has little significance and uh, you know uh, therefore you know just be willing to be abandoned or be willing to be destroyed uh, because your life is of no significance for yourself but it's of greater significance for God for his service and for his uh, ministry so here he is this great apostle uh, to the Gentiles uh, a man who did more to spread the gospel than any other man in church history and uh, whose influence was somebody who was it's so great that we can't even calculate but uh, yet you know uh, we see he could finish his race so well because he saw himself of, 
as of little significance and therefore he is willing or able to abandon or be destroyed and be poured out as a drink um, uh, offering okay so uh, this is something that we can learn as well you know just to know that our our life is you know we need to present our lives as a living sacrifice and at any time be willing to die for uh, you know, for our calling, for the the uh, uh, the name that is that we are called by, that we are identified by, and the kingdom that uh, we are you know uh, ushered uh, into. Okay, so it's important that we live with this whole thing that we are nothing, we are of little significance, and that whatever we do is for the glory. Uh, of uh, God. When we do that, when we live our lives like this, we will be able to continue and finish well. Uh, and all of us uh, should view our life and our service as a sacrificial offering uh, to God. And then he says, you know, there's when you do that, there's a deep sense of accomplishment because he says, I fought a good fight. Uh, because then, uh, and he's able to say that because he says that, you know, I have a deep sense of accomplishment. I have finished the race, which means he says, you know, I have completed what God has taken hold of me, what God has called me for. And, you know, a crown is laid up for me. He says, you know, uh, there is uh, an expectation. Before that, he says, keep the faith, which means, you know, uh, there's a fulfillment that, yes, I have done what has been entrusted to me, what I have called, been called into, and the faith uh, that I have um, encountered, you know, I have been able to fulfill that, and there's a crown laid up for me, uh, which there is an expectation or a hope of a greater reward, you know, a greater blessing and uh, eternal life. Isn't it wonderful the way, you know, Paul just mentions this, about how he's been poured out as a drink offering and how he's viewing his life and how he's able to say with such great confidence that he has fought the fight, he's finished the race, he's kept the faith, and there is going to be a, a you know, crown of righteousness that awaits him on the day of uh, judgment. So this is how we need to view our life, see our life, um, be willing to be sacrificed, be willing to be poured out as a drink offering, and also, you know, be able to fight the good fight, be able to finish the race, keep the faith, uh, because we know there is a great reward and we know that there is a great hope and we're doing this all for the glory of God, for his kingdom, for the extension of his kingdom, okay? Verses 10 to 11, uh, can somebody read that please? Verses 10 to 11. Ten to eleven, and he reads. Sorry. Ten to eleven, yes, it says, um, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner, and life, purpose, faith, long suffering, love, perseverance, persecution, affliction, which happened no, to me. No, uh, say sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry. Say. Um, Verses nine to eleven of chapter four. Nine to eleven. Sorry, chapter four, sorry. Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica, Christian, Christians for Galatia, and Titus for Dalmatia. Um, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. Amen. Thank you, Say. So here Paul longs to see Timothy soon and, you know, because others have left, uh, he says only Luke is with him. And then he also gives uh, a sad account of uh, this man called Demas, who was a fellow worker with Paul. Paul writes about him in Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. Philemon chapter 1, verse uh, uh, 24. He says, you know, this... Um, uh, you know, this person traveled with Paul, ministered along with Paul. Uh, he has basically seen the mighty works that God has been doing through Paul, but now he's forsaken Paul and the work of the kingdom because he's drawn away by the things of this uh, world. So Paul is warning Timothy, you know, you be on your guard. 
uh, don't abandon your uh, life ass 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 uh, assignment you know that god has given you uh, to uh, you know to the things of this world don't don't be drawn by the things of this uh, uh, world so this is something as a warning for us as well you know we can be so much into ministry we can be so much in love for god passionate for god but you know there there can be a time when we can be drawn away by the things of the world so we always need to work out our salvation dear daily with fear and uh, trembling so that you know the things of the world will not suddenly take us away uh, from uh, the things of uh, god and uh, very nice to see here you know your know, Paul is saying, you know, uh, get John Mark with me. Uh, uh, get John Mark and bring him with you. Now, you know, it's very interesting to note, you know, uh, Paul's, um, you know, attitude, his change of heart towards John Mark, who was Barnabas's nephew. When Paul went on his first missionary journey, uh, Paul and Barnabas went together, and Barnabas took along with him his nephew John Mark, and they left to Antioch and went to the seaport town of Cytheria, and from there they sailed to Cyprus, and then they came on to the east coast of Cyprus, and then they went all around the west coast, and when they reached the west coast of Cyprus, you know, John Mark I think was tired of all the travel and all the ministry. Um, he just had enough, so he wanted to go back home. And uh, Paul was kind of upset about that. You know, how can he just desert them? How can he, you know, be so, um, uh, you know, uh, selfish? Or he's not committed to the task. He would have had all of these notions about John Mark. So when, uh, uh, you know, Paul wanted to go on a second missionary journey, uh, he again tells Barnabas, who's become his good partner in mission trips, tells him, come along, let's go. And John, uh, sorry, Barnabas wanted to take his debut again, John Mark, and uh, Paul refuses. And they have such a strong disagreement and strong contention and uh, uh, argument that, you know, Paul and Barnabas finally split. Barnabas takes John Mark and goes on his missionary journey. And Paul takes Silas along with him and goes to um, Antioch. But later on, he hears news about how well John Mark is doing and all of that. And his whole uh, mindset, his whole idea about uh, what he had about John Mark has changed. And, uh, you know, he tells him here, you know, bring John Mark along uh, uh, with you, uh, Timothy, when you come, because he's useful for me uh, in the ministry. So there's something that we can learn here. You know, yes, people have a past, but we don't hold on to their past. You know, if they we have seen them change, transformed, because God can redeem people. You know, just overlook their past, see what God is doing for uh, in their lives now, in the present, and. Uh, you know, that's what we need to learn uh, with each other. And also when God can change their lives and God can accept them and use them in the ministry, you know, uh, yes, he can. We need to also uh, uh, do the same. Yes, Elisha, how can we describe the te temperament of uh, Paul? Uh, very human. Uh, you know, even though he's a great apostle, he's very, very human. Uh, he goes through human weaknesses and frailties and thoughts, just like uh, you and I go through. And yes, anyone would, you know, looking at somebody like that and somebody who's so zealous for missions and looking at somebody who wants to go back home and, you know, not want to continue on missions, uh, we too can be angered, we too can be irritated. Uh, but look at the way, uh, you know, Paul is able to make changes about the way he has thought about people, how he writes about them, how he uh, warns people about them, and his grief about how people have left the faith, gone away. Uh, so, yes, you know, uh, uh, he has human weaknesses, but yet, uh, you know, is able to change, accommodate, uh, and also love people and, um, you know, uh, give them the credit that is due for what they have done and how they have accompanied him for what they are doing. Okay. Uh, any other questions anyone else has so far? Um, Pastor, is this the same John Mark that Peter refers to as his son in his last letter? I don't know if I'm confusing it. He did say something, my son John Mark. 
Um, let me just quickly find it. I think he said something about. I don't know if it's the same John Mark. In uh, Second Peter, or Second uh, Peter. in his yeah. cell. Second Peter, I think three verse eighteen. His last. Second, uh, Second Peter chapter three was. Um, I'm looking for it. I, I think it's First Peter. Sorry. Okay, say so you can uh, take your time and look at it till then. I think Rupa has put up a hand. I don't know, Rupa, is that by accident? Or... Ma'am, I just wanted no. to say something about John Mark. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. John Mark, he is the mentee of Peter. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, when you dwell on it, the reason they say that John Mark left during his first missionary journey was because if you study the book of Galatians, there is mm -hmm. there comes a place where uh, Paul corrects Peter and also Barnabas. They, 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 he opposes them because mm -hmm. they were acting uh, uh, differently before the Jewish people who have come from Jerusalem. Is very young, mm -hmm. and uh, I think he was upset the way his mentor was dealt there, and and that is the reason why that uh, John Mark has left during his first missionary journey. He left and went back because Peter was his mentor, and he was so close. Barnabas was also; they both were seniors in the first, uh, beginning church, early church, compared to Paul, mm -hmm. Saul. Hmm. So they say that because of that, if you see the dates also, ma'am, in Galatians, mm -hmm. it is written in uh, 34 to 35 AD. That is the time after Paul comes to the uh, to Christian faith. Barnabas go, uh, goes after him, seeks him in Tarsus, brings him to the into the ministry, all that. You see the transition from saying Paul and Barnabas and Paul to Paul and Barnabas in, in the Acts. Yes. But all that is okay because he has that heart, Barnabas. But uh, here we see Ma, John Mark, say, they say that because he was hurt the way um, Peter was encountered, opposed by Paul. It is the right thing only, but because of his age. And uh, Barnabas, as the nature of Barnabas, he brings him back. And it, the Spirit of God works in Paul is so beautifully. Through the end of his life, again, there is a great uh, peace and acceptance. And the way he writes about John Mark is so beautiful. You see a, mm -hmm. a great, uh, uh, we see a change in Paul, Paul's yes. life that way. It's so beautiful. I just wanted to add, ma'am, it may be, it's my, how I... Thank you, Rupa. Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of look into that and then maybe, you know, get back uh, at what you said. Uh, but thank you for uh, highlighting that. Uh, so, yeah, say. Yes, I, I found it, Pastor. Um, first... Yes. First Peter, chapter 5. Are you there, Say? Hello, Say, are you there? Pastor, he has left the meeting just now. Come okay. Back. Okay, so maybe we'll, uh, yeah, that's actually, he's talking about John Mark, uh, the same Mark of Acts 12, 12. Acts 12, 25, and also Acts 15, verse 37 and 39. So here we see in Acts 12, 12 it says, So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the, mo uh, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. And there were many who were gathered praying uh, there. Acts 12, 25, which talks about 
Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and they took with them John whose surname was Mark and also Mark Acts chapter 15 37 and 39 says now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark but Paul insisted that they should not take him take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another and so Barnabas took uh, Mark and sailed to Cyprus. So um, Rupa, thank you for, uh, yeah, uh, first of all, say this is John Mark that is mentioned by, uh, you know, Peter in uh, 1 Peter chapter 5. Um, but yeah, uh, Rupa, I'll just get back to what you have said because here, uh, what I said was basically what was written in Acts chapter 15, uh, you know, Paul, uh, and Barnabas, Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with them, but Paul insisted that they should not take him with them because the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia had not gone with them to the work. Uh, then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another and so uh, Barnabas and uh, sailed to uh, Cyprus. Okay, so in that context is what I said, but I can always... Um, take a look at uh, uh, you know uh, what you mentioned as well yes say so uh, yes pastor no, yes no, you're no, no. It. yeah is, first uh, one up. minute say uh, Christopher is John Mark what uh, uh, say is mentioning in first Peter chapter 5 uh, is not the same mark that uh, he is talking about uh, the Sun uh, here he's, he's basically saying uh, this verse connects Mark with Peter, uh, you know, uh, apparently the same Mark of Acts 12.12, 12, which I just read for you, uh, you know, uh, John whose surname was Mark and 12.25 where Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem and uh, they took with them John whose surname was Mark and also Acts 15 where Paul and Barnabas were you know, had a strong dis disagreement with uh, uh, with the son. So here it's talking about John Mark, yes. Yeah. But it's not talking about Mark the Evangelist who's different. No, the, the writer of the book of Mark, no, it's different. Yeah. Is that, uh, does that help, but uh, say? Yes, Pastor, that helps. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Yeah. OK. Um, now we'll continue with uh, Paul continuing. Yes, Christopher. Uh, sorry, uh, no, because uh, I was just going through um, some of the references to John Mark, uh, hmm. and they said that um, it's considered to be the same as Mark the Evangelist, uh, the one who wrote uh, the Gospel of Mark. So I just wanted to find out okay. if that's, uh, that's confirmed. Uh, let me just check on that, uh, uh, Christopher, and get back to you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, I'll just check on what Kennedy says, what Christopher says, and also Rupa, and then uh, get back, okay? Yeah. Okay, so we'll continue on with um, uh, verses 12 to 15. Okay, so Paul is requesting... Uh, Timothy, when he comes to bring his cloak, uh, since winter is approaching, he has no warm clothes. Basically, when uh, Paul was arrested in Taurus, uh, they say during his second imprisonment, you know, uh, those uh, in those days when soldiers used to arrest people, they used to take away their extra garments and all their possessions that they had. Uh, the one they are arresting. So Peter, uh, sorry, Paul already was forewarned of his arrest. And so he leaves his parchments and his cloak uh, with a man, uh, honest man named Carpus. So that's not taken away. So Paul is telling Timothy when he comes, you know, uh, get all of these things because it's cold. And also he wanted his parchments, which are portions of the Old Testament. Uh, so we see that Paul is so interested in still learning, still writing, uh, making his last days even more uh, meaningful. Then he talks about, uh, Paul warns Timothy about Alexander the coppersmith, who he's already talked about and mentioned in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 20, uh, where Paul uh, has already, and we've already looked at it, where, you know, Alexander is someone who has shipwrecked his faith. Um, and Paul is now warning Timothy about the same man, 
uh, Paul um, is, simply writes that he did him much harm uh, and that he would also oppose Timothy and that's why he should uh, be aware of him or be careful of him uh, you know um, uh, and this you know this phrase where he says you know uh, because he has greatly resisted our words you must be aware of him for he has greatly resisted our words or another you know thing is that he has informed many things against me uh, perhaps it was alexander the coppersmith who was a traitor an informer who betrayed paul to the roman government and hence he was had his hand or somebody was responsible uh, in his paul's current uh, imprisonment and so perhaps the thought that you know he has greatly resisted our words meant that alexander was a witness against paul at his first uh, defense so Paul is saying, you know, hey, Timothy, you be careful. Now, you know, he can even attack you. Uh, be very careful about uh, uh, Alexander the Copper uh, Smith. And then in verses 17 to 18, he talks about, um, you know, uh, you know, Paul shares about his first trial. Uh, where you know took place two years prior to his when he was first imprisoned in Rome, his uh, two years of house arrest, his first imprisonment, and when he was put in trial uh, before Nero, he says, you know, even then everyone forsook him, just like everyone has forsaken him now. But Paul says, you know, he holds no grievances against all those who forsook him during his hardship, during his hard time. Uh, you know, uh, it's amazing that, you know, even as people have deserted him, have, uh, you know, uh, stopped communicating with him with the fear that they would also be imprisoned. You know, Paul does not hold any resentment, hatred, or bitterness at them uh, or towards them. Uh, but he says, you know, when he was alone, the Lord was the one who delivered him, uh, even as, you know, uh, from being sentenced to death, God, how God was there with him, how he uh, got him out of that first imprisonment. And he says how he used that opportunity, you know, to proclaim the gospel in the courtroom to the Gentiles and the Romans who were there, who heard the good news in the courtroom, who otherwise had no opportunity to hear the good uh, news. So Paul Paul uh, is, is putting his confidence again in the same God, you know, who delivered him from every evil work and preserved him, uh, you know, from every evil work of the enemy, from Nero, from his first Roman imprisonment, uh, you know, preserved him so that he could uh, minister and build his kingdom. Um, and, you know, um, uh, uh, and he's just saying that, you know, even as the Lord Jesus Christ was there with him, he's there with him even now, even as people have forsaken him. Uh, but the emphasis here is not that he will not suffer or be persecuted or even killed. Uh, Paul, you know, um, already has mentioned in verse 6 that he's, he knows that, you know, uh, that all that he's going through, he acknowledged that his life will be poured out as a drink offering. Uh, but he's saying that, you know, that anything that the evil one or the enemy or his schemes or his plans to rob him of his peace, his joy, his trust in his savior or his eternal destination will not succeed. But God will preserve him for his eternal uh, uh, kingdom. OK, that's so amazing that, you know, we need to have the same kind of hope, the same kind of confidence in the God who we serve. Even when we go through challenges and difficulties, look back at the blessings, look back at how God has helped you, uh, helped you overcome. And then, you know, Paul just breaks out into again praise and worship. He says to him, be the glory forever and ever. He just uh, reflects on the unreasonable optimism and joy and um, uh, you know paul faced even in this last moments of his life even though he was without money without friends without his possessions he was cold did not have enough clothing uh, and that was looming large over him even then you know he just praises god he has his confidence in this in this god he's serving the god he's put his trust in and he knows that there is an heavenly reward awaiting for uh, him and then he sends his greetings to Priscilla and Aquila, who were there with Paul's team, who served in Corinth. Uh, we, we studied about them when we looked at the introduction to the Book of Romans. They were originally from Rome. 
uh, but because of the persecution in Rome, they joined Paul at Corinth. They helped in establishing the church at Corinth. Then they moved, uh, this couple moved on to Ephesus where they trained Apollos and they sent him to Corinth. Uh, so Paul remembers, uh, you know, with the gratefulness, with gratitude, and sends his greetings to Aquila and uh, Priscilla, also to Onifis, Onif Onisiphorus, uh, who Paul has already mentioned earlier in this chapter, in chapter 1 of Second Timothy, uh, chapter 1, verse 16, um, and who served, you know, some Onisiphorus is somebody who served Paul at Ephesus and at Rome, and Paul mentions how Onesiphorus, you know, look for Paul in Rome and serves him. And he wants to thank him and sends his greetings as well. Also, he talks about uh, Trophimus, uh, who he left sick in Miletus. Now, this is very strange that, uh, you know, Paul is acknowledging that he has left one of his own fellow workers, companions, co-workers sick at Miletus. You know, Paul uh, was so mightily used and flowing in all the gifts of the Spirit, uh, bringing healing and deliverance to people. But it's strange that he says, he writes that he leaves one still sick. Um, so how do we look at uh, this? You know, um, Paul ministered in the same way that you and I also minister through the power of the Holy Spirit and in Jesus' name. Uh, and we do not know anything about Trophimus' sickness, how long he was sick, what was the outcome. Uh, but one thing we know that, you know, Paul left him sick, but this does not any way change who God is. You know, God is still Jehovah Rapha. He's the Lord, our healer. He will heal. He will continue to heal. Um, and this does not also change what God has asked us to do or commission uh, asked to do to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cast out demons, uh, we must do that. But like Paul, we will always not see success in every case where we are trying to speak healing, pray healing, or deliver people, uh, which means that does not change our theology about who God is. God is always a healer. He will continue to heal. He will heal. But at times when we don't see healing, you know, we press in, uh, to and go back to God, we press in and ask Him what is lacking, what we should have done, what we shouldn't uh, have done, or what we should do in the future. Just press in for uh, you know for greater move of God, for greater healing, and for greater completeness in healing that we can um, uh, see. So Paul is uh, not you know trying to cover up or you know say you know, but he's willing to even acknowledge his weaknesses. Hey, I left one sick there. Um, you know, and um, uh, he talks about Trophimus. So this is what we can also know that even as Paul was not able to bring about healing in everybody's life, there are times when it will happen in our lives as well, but that should not change our theology about who God is and that he is a healer and also should not stop us from praying and continue to heal people and to press in and ask God, you know, uh, what is the reason, what should we do better, what is lacking in us, what should we have done, what shouldn't we have uh, done. So then Paul closes verses 21 and 22. He says, no, do your utmost to come before winter. And then he sends uh, greetings of people from Eulabius, uh, uh, Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren send greetings to Timothy. And then he closes the letter with saying, the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit and grace be with you okay so we finish chapter four and that's in second timothy anyone has any questions other than john mark uh, which i will uh, look into do a study and uh, get back to you anyone else has any questions any doubts no questions no questions, anyone? Okay, there are no questions. We'll uh, end class. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining class. And I will see you uh, next week. I, today is your assessment on um, 
a second assessment on the uh, uh, on children's ministry which i'll post by the end of today okay yeah thank you everyone have a good week and a good day ahead god bless thank you Bye. thank you ma'am god bless you thank you elisha